Perfect. Well, thank you very much to the University um, of Utah for inviting me here to speak and to the Neurogenic Bladder Research Group. It's a pleasure to be part of uh, such a high-functioning group. So after spinal cord injury, we all know that, spinal func uh, that bladder function and um, bladder complications are consistently ranked in the top three of um, problems by spinal cord injured patients. We know that bladder function has a sp significant impact on patients' quality of life. Uh, studies have shown they spend a median of four hours a week on their bladder function. It has the second highest impact out of all complications on their social activities. The need for any type of catheter lowers their quality of life and over 70% of patients after spinal cord injury need to use a catheter. Urinary tract infections and urinary incontinence occur in over 50% of the people after spinal cord injury. Those are common complications and they're ones that are potentially addressable and impacted by bladder management. So let's talk about CIC. We all know it's a gold standard for bladder management. It probably has a lower risk of urinary tract infections and probably better protection of the upper tracts. But there's really no high-level evidence to say CIC is good and other things are bad. A Cochrane review done in 2013 couldn't find any studies to support um, any recommendations. And recent studies have shown that maybe indwelling catheters aren't as bad as some of the historical data um, paints. CIC definitely has drawbacks to it. Studies have consistently shown that if you need a caregiver to do CIC, um, that impacts your quality of life and you have a significantly lower quality of life. People that have caregivers doing CICs have a five-fold increased risk of depression. They have the highest risk of urinary incontinence, and they often require behavioral modification and increased time from the um, person with a spinal cord injury. And that leads us to the disconnect that we see in our practices all the time. After spinal cord injury, the majority of patients do go out of rehab hospitals using CIC, but over time they tend to migrate to an indwelling catheter despite the negative aspects that neurourologists um, are well versed with and despite what physicians often um, counsel them about. We always talk about bladder management from a medical perspective, but the patient perspective is one that hasn't been explored or taken into account um, quite as fully. So what are some of the barriers to CIC? So there's actually been numerous um, qualitative studies interviewing patients and getting their feedback on CIC. And it's actually interesting to see what their major um, problems and concerns are with CIC. So one, lack of appropriate public facilities. They just can't do CIC when they're out of their house. They have difficulties because of spasticity, hand function, or decreased visual acuity. It requires a lot of time in terms of positioning and setup. Supplies are expensive. They're very worried about the risk of self-harm. And again, it's something probably as urologists we're a bit desensitized to. We think about putting catheters in all the time. We get some blood, not a big deal. To patients, that's a big deal. They really feel like they're hurting their own body and don't like that risk. Complications that patients see from their perspective, infections, bleeding, difficulty passing the catheter, the unpredictable need for when they need to do a catheter, and incontinence between catheterizations. So what about when you ask patients about indwelling catheters? They see them as advantages for preventing urinary incontinence. The biggest thing they all say is it just simplifies their life. Life's just so much easier when they just have a catheter in there and they don't have to think about their bladder. They feel it improves their independence, but it definitely has some downsides. And the interesting thing is when you read these studies, the downsides aren't sort of things that we would think about. They're very technical things that should be fixable. The need to conceal a bag. They just don't like the way bags work. They don't like hanging them on the side of their chair and having everyone look at what their urine output is the bag inadvertently becoming disconnected from the uh, catheter, how to drain it in public facilities, how to tell when the bag's full, and planning intimacy. You know, the top four really are technical things that should be fixable by a, a decent engineer and some new design ideas. So from a medical perspective, it's logical to hypothesize that known risks with indwelling catheters, like infections, renal failure, bladder stones, urethral injury, would mean patients experience a poorer quality of life. But is it actually any different between bladder management strategies? So there's been about a dozen studies that have looked at this. Um, there's a couple consistent messages you see across these studies. One, spontaneous voiding is better than using any type of catheter in terms of quality of life. Intuitive, makes sense. And then finally, multiple studies have shown that if you have to have a caregiver do your CIC, you have a much worse quality of life than if you can do it yourself. However, when we stratify patients based on their um, method of bladder management, whether it be CIC, indwelling, or other drainage modalities, the results are a bit more mixed. So there are four prior studies um, 
from the US, UK, and Turkey that have looked at this. They've used various different questionnaires. The first one showed that CIC was better in terms of mental health scores and personal relationships and emotional scores. The second one was a large one from the US using the model system um, spinal cord injury database. Thousands of patients, they were able to adjust for multiple comorbidities. Um, but when you actually look at the scores, there's statistically significant differences, but most of the differences are small. We're talking decimal place differences between quality of life in terms of comparing indwelling catheter to CIC. So whether those differences are actually clinically significant is questionable. Two other studies, no difference based on bladder management technique. So obviously, many people in this room are familiar with the PCORI study led by Jeremy Sean um, and um, the Enbridge group. Um, it's going to provide the most definitive assessment of quality of life based on bladder management and allows for adjustment of important variables and takes into account surgical and medical adjuncts. But until, um, until now, there's really been very little data on this. And if we take a step back, I think the important question is what actually drives some people to choose their bladder management strategy in the first place? So why do people actually pick what they end up with? So after a spinal cord injury, how do people prioritize different issues which interact with their bladder management choice? So my hypothesis is there's several medical, socioeconomic, psychosocial factors which influence the selection of bladder management techniques after spinal cord injury. As physicians, we're very good at addressing the medical issues, but probably not so good at addressing the other ones. And probably these other ones may be as important or even more important than the medical ones in terms of driving bladder management uh, selection. So I wanted to look at this in a little bit of a different way. There's been a lot of studies using um, quantitative studies where you sort of interview a bunch of patients, you transcribe them, you look through these, um, these interviews and you come up with themes or concepts that tend to come up with, that tend to come up with frequently. Um, the limitations of the current literature out there, though, in terms of the qualitative studies, they're mixed patient populations. They almost exclusively focus on CIC. None of them take into account multiple domains of CIC. So they say, what are the physical barriers that impact CIC? But then they ignore all the rest of the aspects that impact CIC. Um, there's a systematic review underway to summarize this literature, which is almost complete. But what about using a quantitative methodology? So as a researcher, I still like to have numbers and be able to rank things and be able to say, look, the data proves something. And to do this kind of study with quantitative methodology, there's not a lot of options out there. But one thing you can do is something called conjoint analysis or discrete choice analysis. This is used in market research. Um, probably everyone in here has done one of those studies, perhaps for a drug company, um, where they ask you to look at two scenarios and pick your favorite scenario. And then the scenario comes up again, but they modify certain things in those scenarios. And using that method, you can actually tease out what drives um, patient choice and how much, um, how much these different variables impact on decisions. There's a nice method that was developed by a commercial software company called Adaptive Choice Conjoint Analysis. The nice thing about it is you can actually use larger um, groups of attributes, larger numbers of factors in your analysis. It produces a more realistic um, experiment, a more realistic analysis, and it allows for a smaller sample size. And it may actually work better than traditional conjoint, be, um, conjoint analysis. Good software is essential, so Sawtooth Software is probably the number one software company out there for conjoint analysis. It's very easy to use, it's very easy to set up, um, but also very expensive. For those of you that are interested, there is a whiteboard uh, video out there going through conjoint analysis and how it's used which is actually very good. I put that in there because I know Jeremy loves whiteboard videos. Um, I wanted to go through a couple examples. So in urology, this hasn't really been used that much in clinical studies. Um, this is an example of one done in the spinal cord injured population. The question was, what do people actually care about in developing a hypothetical neural prosthesis? So the researchers identified attributes, which you can see in the first column here, invasiveness, effect on incontinence, effect in voiding, and then different levels for each attribute. So it could have electrodes implanted under the skin, it could have a need for a hospital admission, it could be a bigger hospital admission. That's how you stratify the different levels of invasiveness. And then the software creates these different options, and you give this to your target population, and they go through and they have to pick option A, option B. 
And each time they do that, basically what happens is almost subconsciously you'll select the option based on the dominant thing you care most about. So maybe if you care most about cost, you're generally always going to select option B with the no out-of-pocket costs. But maybe sometimes you'll see really bad complications as a potential risk and you'll say, well, in that setting, maybe I'm willing to pay $100. And by doing that, you can actually statistically sort out what their preference rating is. So if you look here, this is an example from that study. The way you interpret these utilities, the relative weights of the utilities, is by the slope of the um, change within an attribute. So for example, if we look at cost to user, this doesn't really change from none to $1,500. It stays pretty stable. So the interpretation of that would be users don't really care that much about cost. But then when you look at side effect, you can see here it goes from almost one down to zero. So the interpretation there is the driving factor in making the decision on a hypothetical neural prosthesis is all about complications for patients. That's the primary thing they care about. And the change from an occasional complication to the side effects of a rhizotomy, huge setback, huge deterrent to them accepting a neural prosthesis. You can quantify those, um, the relative importance of these different attributes and then look at the numbers. So you can say, OK, side effects, that's the driving factor. And look, it's, um, it's almost 10 times more important than cost. So in urology, as I said, this has only been done in a, a few limited areas, including urethral stricture disease and prostate cancer. Most of these are done in terms of improving um, patient um, comfort with selecting a management option. So in this um, example here for urethral strictures, they use conjoint analysis to improve surgical decision making. Patients were given some information about um, different options for managing urethral stricture disease, predominantly minimally invasive versus urethroplasty. They were then taken through a conjoint analysis exercise where they had to rank their own preferences. So they were given attributes like invasiveness, you know, minimally invasive endoscopic procedure versus open procedure with one day stay. And after they went through that, the software then said, well, you know what, based on your utilities and your values, you're probably best suited to thinking about an endoscopic management at this point. And then they go into the counseling session with their urethroplasty surgeon and they say, well, look, you know, I sort of am thinking along the lines of urethroplasty and that's shown to actually improve um, uh, decisional um, comfort at the time of making decisions in terms of treatment. Very similar example in prostate cancer, same idea. Do you want to do um, surveillance, do um, radiation, uh, do surgery for your prostate cancer? Same idea in terms of reducing um, decisional anxiety. So how can this be applied, applied to bladder management after spinal cord injury? So first thing you have to do is you have to think about attributes related to bladder management. So there's medical complications, which are fairly easy to define. And then there's psychosocial domains again, which I said, we're probably not as good at identifying, and this definitely needs to come from the patient perspective. Um, once you've identified these attributes that you're interested in, then you have to identify levels for them and identify how you can actually phrase that in a way that the patient understands. So for this study, the proposal would start with identifying these attributes. You have to use um, quantitative methodology for this. So you have to interview patients, get their feedback, try to identify attributes and figure out which the most important ones are. Again, you can't have 20 attributes in your study. That makes the analysis way too complex. You have to get it down to sort of five or six key ones. And then from there, you create your, um, your survey or your um, statistical analysis uh, plan. And this is an example of what I see it potentially looking like. So patients would choose the method that would meet their ideal bladder management. Choice A, maybe there's a small chance of incontinence, but choice B, that chance is really small. Maybe you need someone to help you with your bladder function versus you don't need someone to help you with your bladder function. That may represent the independence attribute. So the ultimate vision of this, um, of this idea is after spinal cord injury, patients would be able to use a website to help reduce their decisional um, uh, decisional anxiety and help to inform them of choices that maybe their urologist or their rehab doctor wouldn't necessarily raise with them. So maybe they really value independence, but you know the indwelling catheter attributes that we normally associate with that don't really fit with them. So maybe then the website says, look, you know, you might need something more than just um, just a simple CIC. You might need reconstructive surgery to reach your goals and to reach the um, the attributes that you value most.
for example, a patient with a C5 spinal cord injury, much like the um, examples we had from Dr. Ginsburg today, may have a very high value on time and independence. Being able to tell that patient, you know, CIC is a good option for you, that may not be a good option because realistically, simple CIC per urethra probably won't work easily for that patient and probably won't allow them to have the independence they want and probably will require more time than they need. So in conclusion, bladder management is an important determinant of quality of life after spinal cord injury. CIC does not maximize quality of life for many people after spinal cord injury. Conjoint analysis is a new analytic method in terms of medicine, but it's been around for a long time in business that is applicable to many questions in urology and I think well suited to um, address some of the questions around bladder management and spinal cord injury. And from that, we can hopefully identify the relative importance of medical complications, socioeconomic, psychosocial factors, stratify them based on gender, level of function, um, and help uh, understand and counsel patients better in terms of bladder management and um, give them a bit more empowerment in terms of what they select and being happy with their choice that they select. Thank you very much.